Hi, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven. We're joined today by Lori Baker Shenna. Um, she is, uh, she well, she's on her third career, which I think is really interesting. So I'll give a little bit more of an introduction about those first two careers and what she does now. But Lori, let me first um, welcome you to the podcast. How are you? Mark, I am great. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to say hi to your audience. They're so lucky to have you as a host. You bring such great insight to your podcast. It's just a joy to be here. Oh, well, thank you. That's very, that's very kind of you, Lori. I appreciate that. Um, so Lori has a really interesting background. Um, and, you know, you can fill in some details if you want here in a second, Lori. But um, career one was as a, a journalist and a public relations professional. Lori was then a professor for 25 years. And now she's into her third career as um, a coach and a speaker. Um, she's co-founded, uh, it's called the Lead Her Ship Consortium. So there is an H-E-R in there, of course. Lead Her Ship Consortium, LLC. Um, she has a PhD in organizational leadership. Um, that was, I don't know why that was so hard to say. So <laughs> again, um, welcome. Is there anything about your background and your multiple careers that you want to share with us, Lori? Well, just the fact that, we all think when we get out of school, whether it's high school or college, that we're going to have one career for the rest of our lives. And that's just a myth, Mark. It's really important to realize that you are going to, you know, look, God willing, you're going to live a long time and you're not going to want to stay in one career. So many of us decide that we're going to have multiple careers. So I started off as a journalist and then really kind of eased into public relations, started my own business when I was 29. And then I got a call saying that they wanted to know if I want at my university, if I wanted to be an emergency hire for a professor. And I said, sure, because why not? <laughs> and that ended up being a 25 year career. And then I decided um, after a bout with cancer that, you know what, my real dream is to be a motivational, you know, professional speaker and a leadership coach. And I had earned a doctorate in organizational leadership. So I said, okay, so this is my third career, but it's really everything I've done, I've really enjoyed. And um, that's what I want to bring to people. So you really need to enjoy what you're doing. And if you're not enjoying it, figure out what to do next. Mm, yeah, yeah. So maybe we can, we'll talk about those career transitions and, and some of those other topics that you help people with. Um, but first off, you know, I don't know if the story will be related to any of these career transitions or what it is, but Lori, what would you say is your favorite mistake? My first, no, I think my second job in a big company, I was hired and they, and I had to report to two bosses and I had no idea how that would go because I was very, I was young. I think I was 27 and naive. I had not really worked in, in big companies that much. And not only did I have to report to two bosses, but these two bosses didn't like each other. And so they were competing for my time. And, and at the end of the day, I couldn't make either of them happy. And the three of us were miserable. Uh, it was just a triangle of misery and it really, taught me so much about politics, about asking for what you need. And the fact of the matter is that it's very difficult in the real world to have two bosses. You know, they have the, those matrix um, org right. charge and stuff. And unless there's incredible um, communication and collegiality, it's destined for uh, a difficult time. And I, I really, I was so miserable, Mark, I can't tell you. And I didn't realize it, but that is my favorite mistake because it, it launched me into my own, my own business because misery says, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And so I ended up yeah. with my own business, but, but I, and I had no idea. No one said, no one sat me down in college and said, Lori, be sure not to, you know, be hired by in a position where you have two bosses. No one ever says that to you. And it's, just rot with dangerous, like going into the crocodile den. I mean, I can give you all sorts of analogies. It was that bad, but is, but it really, if it wasn't that bad, I'd still might be stuck in a, a corporate job I didn't want. So very, very happy, yeah. very happy. So it, it, it led to um, at least a better outcome where you, you said, I, I'm not gonna take that risk of repeating that mistake again. Absolutely. And who knew? You know, when you when you come out of college, one of the things they never teach you is how to deal with the politics of a of a company, 
And that really, really struck me because so many people don't know how to handle conflict in the workplace and uh, not understanding how to ask for what you need and how to communicate better with your boss and your colleagues. And it, uh, you know, I had an MBA, it didn't help me at all. It, it, It didn't help me at all. So I ended up eventually getting a doctorate in organizational leadership because it, it was, it still fascinated me how dysfunctional organizations can be. And they don't know, they might understand it, but they don't know how to get out of it. Yeah. And thinking of, you know, when you took that job, um, how, how quickly did you realize that dysfunction? And did you think about getting out of it right away? It took me about two months to realize that I, that I couldn't do, I didn't have, they didn't give me the time to do what I needed to do because they were each vying for, theoretically I was split 50, 50, but it never was like that. Someone wanted someone more than others. And then there were the deadlines were different and, and Mark, they didn't talk to each other. So I ended up being the conduit and a 27 year old person, basically fresh out of, you know, college and MBA program shouldn't be a conduit. Um, and I, if I was to do now that I know what I know, you know, years and years later, but yeah, it took me about two months. And then, and then I loved the work. So I really stayed, but then one of the people left and the other person was having issues with, you know, upper management. So it got even worse. It was just bad. And so I realized at the end of it, I'm, I'm a writer by trade and I was so demoralized at the end of that, I, I really needed to do something. So that's why I, I had wonderful mentors and they said, you know, you have to do something else. This is not going to work for you. You you can't be that miserable in a job. You just can't. Yeah. And so you, you were there for about two years? Two years. years. Right before you went and started a firm? How long? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. two years. Yeah, so, two years. Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough when, I don't know, you know how often you end up in this situation, but um, you know, you're, you're placed in a position where somebody wants a little bit of mentoring or they just want to talk about their situation. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's hard when you see people sort of stuck in that situation of, um, I want to leave or I need to leave, but I can't, you know, for, for some one reason or another. But, you know, I think there are times where I, I, th- I think, you know, as an outside observer to a situation, the only conclusion I can draw is, you're going to have to try to find a better environment if someone's in a situation where they can't fix those dynamics of uh, their their boss or bosses or you know the culture of the organization that they work within. Absolutely, and it's scary. It's scary to realize that you're in, in a in a you're in a tough culture, and you know you complain complain all you want, but that doesn't it doesn't help the situation, and um. Luckily, it didn't. It didn't end up with the abusive. It wasn't like real abusive. It was just miserable. But I always told my students that if you're in an abusive relationship with your boss, where your boss is yelling at you, can't do anything right, quit, get a job at Starbucks or something, and find something else because the your mental health is is really really important, especially younger people to really realize that. And um, and then as you get older, you learn how to communicate with with the boss and 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 how to and how to you know, improve the situation yourself, which is another factor. A lot of people can deal with that because they can say, you know what, I'm going to give you 50% of my time and the 50% else is going to the other person. And this is what it looks like. But I didn't have the skills at the time, nor the words, nor the, now I could go in there and, you know, kick butt. <laughs> but when you're 27, not so much. And, and so that is really to empower employees to be able to do that. So the big lesson here is that you really need to understand where you are and what you can change and what you can't. Yeah, yeah. And I've talked to some people who they're, they're conflicted because they feel like maybe they're at a level where they should be able to help influence the situation. And by removing themselves from it, they feel like they're giving up. But, you know, that's where I think, you know, you've got to think is your loyalty to the organization or to yourself? And where, where do you where do you draw the line? Is it I mean, by your vote, you're voting um, by continuing. To, it is a choice to continue coming to work where I think it's helpful. I'm curious your thoughts of like, you know, is this a habit or I mean, yeah, I guess it is a choice. I keep coming here. There must be a reason. It is a choice. And I'm, I'm big on the fact that we can't. Everything we do is a choice. 
We wake up in every morning. This is one of my motivational speeches. We have the choice to either wake up and be really happy and joyful every day, or we have a choice to wake up and be miserable. People like me who are cancer survivors and or survive, you know, illnesses or all sorts of um, accidents, they wait, they're just happy to wake up. So that's always the win, right? So it's easy to, it's easy to choose joy, but you've got to make those decisions. And, you know, what how, so the question then becomes how do you base those decisions well you base it on do i have control of the situation or don't i have control you don't have control mark of how people act or how a boss is trained you know people don't have the right training to be leaders and and all the sort of they might just have hold a grudge they might be having a bad day whatever but you do have control over how you react so figuring out how to emotionally distance yourself from this person while you continue to work with them and perhaps look for another job. There's strategies that you can use so you can tolerate the situation, but you should always think, I I really believe in think of yourself and what your needs are, because if you're contributing to the company and they're really just to stay there because you're afraid to leave. You're afraid to disappoint someone or you're, you know, where you're afraid someone's going to think less of you are not reasons to stay. Yeah. So when you talk about needs, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on something you, you know, you first brought up when you were telling your story, um, asking for what you need. I'm sure there's, there's a lot more you could say about that, what that means to you and how does somebody put that into action? It's very difficult for people people, especially women, to ask for what they need. We are, we're people pleasers. We're afraid that we're going to disappoint someone if we ask them for what we need. And we don't know how, how to ask people for what we need. So we end up not getting what we need. I'm going to give you an example of someone who wants to have a raise or a promotion. You know, I would say most times, you have to ask for a raise or promotion. No one's going to hand it to you unless you work for a magical company who really appreciates everything you do. So how do you go about asking for a raise or promotion? So I suggest after a year, year and a half, whatever you feel good at, you, you, you sit down and you're obviously not being, you know, uh, recognized for what you're doing. You sit down and you write a list of accomplishments that help the company. And you title that, what is the value that I have brought to the company? Not what the company, you know, how great I am, but what have I done to value the company? And then you sit down with your manager, you have a separate conversation and you say, I have, I've looked, I've, I've looked over my last 18 months or 12 months of work. And this is the list I've come up with the accomplishments that I've done, the value I've added. I would like a blank, blank raise. In, to to you know to compensate for that. I mean, you you yeah. you it'd be it'd be you want to be direct and and a lot of times you think I really believe I really think you really should, and you just have to say you know I I would like a promotion or I like a raise ba- based on these accomplishments. Mm-hmm. Having that ammunition going in, that's how you learn how to at, get your needs met, or if you yeah. need your boss to communicate with your with you more. You know, like you're not, especially working from home, bosses aren't doing that enough. They're not communicating. So you say, you know, I need help in this blank, blank, blank. Could I please help get that help? Asking with for what you need without shame and without guilt. And you have to be really mindful, Mark, of, of these sort of things. And, and what I hear you saying is to state it directly. I need a promotion and not preface it with, sort of diminishing or apologetic prefaces. Uh, this might sound dumb, but like I, I end up there sometimes like there's people I work with where um, you, and sometimes you have to pick and choose. Like, you know, you hear people, um, it's not always women, but um, kind of saying things that are undermining what they're saying. I'm like, you know, like, oh, please say it more confidently because what you have is really good. You're really good. Don't apologize for what you're saying. Those are so strongly, I feel that way, Mark, that those are such important observations. When I coach, I, I'm really I'm cranky. I get, I get on people. I listen to their words very closely. And I hate to say it, but women in particular will say, I know this sounds silly, or I know I, know I shouldn't be doing this. And, and, it, and I say to them, 
don't tell me it sounds silly. Let me judge if it's going to be silly. Just say what you're going to say. Get to the point with confidence. And and people, that's why one of my big hints is be mindful of how you ask for things and how you show up. Also, uh, people out there, especially women, stop saying I'm sorry. Just stop. Unless you're like, unless you like hurt somebody like with a fist or something. You mean something horrible. Don't say I'm sorry. Just, 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 just be and, and be assertive in your language and be confident, even if you might not be feeling confident. That's, that self-worth really comes through. But I love what you said, Mark. You're right on the money with that. Yeah. And, and I think, um, there, I mean, there's a difference between apologizing after the fact for something that really was a problem versus this kind of proactive apologetic. Why are you apologizing if it's not a problem yet or it might not be a problem? That's, that's really what you're kind of cautioning against, right? Exactly. And we do it subconsciously. If someone taped you all day, how many times do you say, I'm sorry for like silly things? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Or if it's in Canada, how often are you saying, I'm sorry, which is, that's just, (laughs) or the Midwest, you know, (laughs) Yeah, but absolutely small tweak. It it, it really is. It really is. When you, if you're trying to create a a personal leadership brand, you really want to show up as confident. And the first thing you have to think about is how am I presenting to the world? And the first thing you have to really remember is you deserve a raise. You deserve respect. You deserve to work in a good environment. All those things are so important. Yeah. And so thinking back to the story where you had the two bosses, if you could go back in, 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 in time and knowing what you know now or having you know, the words or the confidence to like, how would you have asked those two different bosses for what you needed? I would have let them know. First of all, I would have got all of us in a room at the same time. And mm-hmm. I would have said, okay, I'm here. And what I'd like to know, I, I need two things from you. One, how are you going to communicate with each other concerning my time? And number two, how are you going to communicate to me and to each other what your priorities are? And then yeah. I would ask them what, it's really important just in general to ask your boss what your priorities are what their priorities are and communicate yeah. often. It's just so important. A lot of people don't get that from their bosses and they feel overwhelmed. And they say to me, Lori, what am I going to do? My boss is giving me all this, this stuff to do. And it's interesting in COVID, a lot of people are out of work. And so people are feeling even more overwhelmed. And mm-hmm. what you need to say to your boss is, look, I have this much bandwidth, you know, what are your priorities that need to get done? And right. don't do it defensively. So that's what I would say to them. You know, what are your priorities? This is what, this is the time. I have 50% of my time. That's, you know, half a day. What are your priorities? And how, and how would you like me to help, you know, update you on my progress? Yeah. Communication is crucial, Mark. Yes, for sure. Um, so I want to ask you to elaborate on one other idea. So there's a couple different things that you've said here today. Do you, do you know the movie Office Space? Yes. So one of the things you know I'm thinking of, you talk, it's been a long time. It's, it, 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 you know, the movie generally, I think, has aged well. It's been like 20 years since yes. it's released. But you mentioned having two bosses. Like, so the one, the one character, Peter Gibbons, says something to the effect of, you know, I have seven different bosses. So when I make a mistake, I hear about it from seven different people, <laughs> which is a different, different kind guy. of corporate, corporate <laughs> hell. But I think this is, uh, so when you talk about the thing I wanted you to elaborate on was the idea of, you know, you want to make sure you enjoy what you're doing. And I, and I think there was a conversation between Peter and his neighbor where Peter's trying to figure out what he, he hates working at this company. It's soul sucking. What should he do next? And, you know, I think somebody says or the points brought up about, you know, you should you should do what you love. And I think it's the neighbor who says, like, man, that's garbage. You know, or you know, he said, no, no, that's that's BS, because nobody would want to be a garbage man because they love collecting garbage. Or I've, I've kind of butchered. I've made a mistake in trying to recount. Um, no, I get, no, I get that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what but what, what are your thoughts around you know this idea of follow your passion or at least as you stated it, you should be able to enjoy what you're doing. You know, we're not all lucky enough to follow our passions, but we have to figure out 
the passion of each of our jobs. And we all are working for a service or you know a company that provides something. So in the case of a garbage man, if it wasn't for garbage people, we would be living in a very smelly, awful, dirty world. I think one of the key people in my my world is a garbage person. And so if you've ever lived somewhere where there's a garbage strike, you know, the effect of that on television, it's, it's horrible. I mean, if they, even if they skip our house one week, it's, you know, I'm, I'm flipping out. So so if I was to go into that organization, I would empower garbage people. say, you know what? You are providing an incredibly important business business and a service that people super need. You are really contributing to humanity and to our quality of life. And when you mm-hmm. go into a company and you t- tell them that their mission is bigger than just driving a truck, but really contributing to humanity, that is encouraging and it helps build, bring joy to employees and joy to, uh, you know, the, the entire company. I work with a lot of colleges and universities, and I always say to like the a- admin staff that you are helping people, young people have access to education. And, you know, during the day, in the day, the day weeds, you know, you, you just like, uh, you just can't uh, handle any of that. But if you raise up, if you elevate yourself and say, this is for a greater good, it really helps bring joy into your, your job. I also think another way to find joy in your job is to find out what your strengths are and find a job that you can use those strengths. For example, I'm a really good writer. And so I created a company where all I had to do was write. And I, it was a medical communications uh, company. Been for 33 years. I have never, ever figured out how to do graphics or how to you know, run a rep website or you know, anything. And I, and I just let it go. And I have an MBA and I've, I, I, I still can't budget, right? Okay. But I can write. So I've focused my my work on writing and I found somebody to partner with me to offer websites and I found someone else to partner with me to do budgets so I found my missing links with other people and I brought that support around me but if you can find your strength and figure out a career that matches it you know that is just the ultimate joy yeah yeah and I I love I mean that that word joy um you know makes me think of um uh, there's a book called Joy Inc. Are you familiar with this with this, this book? book? No, I love the title. Yeah, so it's uh, Richard Sheridan. He is the CEO of a company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, software company called Menlo Innovations, and they really very explicitly try to create um, a culture in the workplace where people can feel joy in their work, and a lot of that is being engaged. Like you know, I've seen in manufacturing, and I've seen in healthcare, people doing relatively menial jobs um, that can be engaged to to spark their creativity. And that's why continuous improvement is so important to me, that it it shows respect. And people might say, you know, I'm doing the same thing over and over again, but I can find joy in finding ways to make the work easier. That's really powerful when you see that. Yes, absolutely. There's joy to be found everywhere. And we have to find joy, Mark. We have to, and I've been, my whole thing now, my whole latest theme is pivot to the positive. Um, Mm -hmm. It was every day is a gift, which I still believe. But it's really important to pivot to the positive because it's our only choice. Being negative never moved anybody forward. Mm -hmm. And I always talk about a a coach of a, a, let's say, a basketball team. And the ref just gave him a really bad... um, call or they just lost, you know, by a point or whatever's going on. And the, uh, you never see a coach go, Oh, this, this sucks. And let's give up. You know, a good coach will continue to pivot to the positive. And I know we're down. I know this sucks, but we are going to continue to do well. And we're going to, you know, conquer. That is the way we need to look at our lives. We can't, we can't be negative. So, so how to pivot to the positive, how to see the good, no matter what happens and no matter how much challenges, that's how I think you find real joy. Yeah. And and that's a powerful message, I think, in these times. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw one other thing at you here. Have you seen the show Ted Lasso? I've heard of it. It's new, right? It's, oh, is it, is it, it wonderful? It's fan- the, the, 
It is wonderful. Um, Ted Lasso, um, I, I've mentioned it. It's my new obsession. I've mentioned it in a few episodes. You would love it because uh, in, um, the, all 10 episodes of the first season are available now. It's on um, what is it Apple on? TV Plus. Apple TV Plus. Oh, that's why I haven't seen it. Okay, I have yet. To- if you can get a free trial or, you know, for $5, uh, you know, for the month. Uh, okay, but, you've convinced anyway, me. My gosh, te- it is such a burst of, of positivity. And it's it, in, in, in what can be, you know... Um, you know, uh, you know, kind of upsetting, cynical time. It's just such a refreshing antidote in in a lot of ways. So I, I, I'll, I won't keep going on and on about it. But well, it sounds wonderful. It's, it's worth, it's now worth yeah. getting Apple Plus for. They've got some really good shows on, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, before I was going to ask one other question, but I just want to throw one other thought at you. You've made me think of um, health systems Healthcare organizations, um, Cleveland Clinic is one where they talk about everyone a caregiver. So again, if we think back to um, you know a janitor or you know environmental services is the the phrase that's used in um, healthcare. You know, I think the best health systems help um, you know the, create that connection of like you're not just going around emptying garbage cans; you're helping prevent infections, which is very true. And it's a powerful mission when everyone can realize, um, you know, there's a different hospital um, I visited and worked with where they had these signs around the hospital, you know, people working in nutritional services, you know, a poster with somebody, you know, talking about how the food they provide helps people heal. And I remember the one poster said, sometimes people want a milkshake and that makes them happier. And, and like, it's just when you can see joy in work, um, that, that's, that, that's really great to see. You know, Mark, I got to say that is right on the money. Um, I was hospitalized uh, for a post-cancer uh, operation back in June, June 2020. And those days you couldn't have any visitors in your hospital room. Yeah. And so when the cleaning crew would come in, I it was so good to see a human being because, you know, the nurses were stretched and your, you know, the um, LVNs were stretched. And it was so much fun to talk to people who were cleaning your room. You were just so grateful to see them and... And so they, I'm sure they were trained to, to interact with patients because you're basically there all by yourself and you need that human contact. So, and I had some wonderful conversations and I think that adds a level of um, respect and also, you know, yes. deepens their job. And I think we can use that analogy across, across all sorts of industries that people, you know, people, um, my 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 son's girlfriend got a job helping seniors at a thing called Silver Sneakers, and she talks to older people all day, like sixty five and older, about and and they're lonely, you know. And she, you know, and she realizes that she is bringing a bright spot to them. So it's that elevation of even cust- customer service, cable people, a lot of people are, are plumbers, people don't see anybody. So it's, I don't think anyone's ever talked about that, but it's really elevating what they're doing beyond just the services that they're giving. And I think that is where the joy comes. Yeah. And, you know, there are some hospitals that um, have put in like literally robotic systems that go around and deliver supplies to different parts of the hospital. And, and one reason I don't like seeing that is that robotic cart can't stop, can't smile at somebody as they go by. That cart can't give directions if somebody looks confused and needs some help. Like those are those are additional human elements that may or may not be part of the formal job description. And, and I think we need to embrace that and not drum that out of our workplaces. Especially in the days when you can't have visitors or we're social distancing. It's so true, Mark. That's just, that's very profound. Well, thanks. Um, so one other question though, um, Lori, uh, I wanted to ask you, and this is something when we had a chance to do a pre-chat, this topic came up. Um, you know, the theme here, it's all about learning from mistakes, being open about mistakes. Um, you know, but that isn't always the case. Um, you, you used a phrase when we had chatted before, um, the shame of failure. I was wondering if you could tell us what you think about that. Thank you, Mark. You know, one of the biggest heartbreaks for me is the way society shames failure. And it starts when you're young, but you see it all through, you know, you go on Twitter, I mean, social media, everything. If somebody makes a mistake, no matter how small or how large, there is a public shaming. 
And I think oh, there's a whole generation of students, I think millennials are, are, are victims of this, whose parents did not allow them to fail. And that helicopter parent thing uh, happened. Yeah. And so what happened with these students is that when they did fail, they didn't know how to cope with the failure. And when you get to college, I love teaching college. First of all, parents aren't allowed to call you. So your, the student has to talk to you. You, you never get in California. It's not even legal yeah. for a parent to call a, a, a professor, which There's I privacy love. concerns, it's right? It's the yeah. best because these kids, you know, they've never, you know, they don't have their parent to help. Right. And I think Generation Z is different, but the millennials, they were, they were like this, you know? So, so they're don't, they're not prepared to fail. And the, and the shame of failure that you could see, it was bad. The problem with that is that if we don't fail, we never learn. And, and yeah. with, I, you, we have, I would love to see a society where we fail fail there's someone who says like fail fast and, and get up fast you know we we, we do it and right. we understand that that's part of our evolution as people and that's how we learn and that we're not allowing that to happen so i would love it, it's my fantasy to see failure embraced failure that embraced that we learn from and that yes. we learn you know it's interesting i was i was telling somebody we don't want to see a basketball game where every every ball goes into the basket or a football game where every every um plays a touchdown or a baseball game where everybody gets a hit that would be incredibly boring the the real joy of sports is when people don't make it don't do well and that's just a real great analogy we don't want there's so much to learn and so much depth when people make mistakes and so also we don't really, that whole idea of someone being perfect, perfect is boring. You don't want to go to have a drink with someone who's got the perfect <laughs> life, the perfect family, the perfect job, the perfect house. I mean, I would, that would last five minutes. I'm out, you know, the perfect pet, you know, there's nothing to talk about that. The, the, I think humanity comes from people who aren't perfect, but who are really learning how to grow and be. And so that, uh, that's why I love, I love your podcast because my favorite mistake really that whole title puts it in perspective because it can a mistake can be a favorite mistake. I mean, I think it's revolutionary, Mark. I mean, no kidding. I just think that whole idea is so important to embrace and to be easy on ourselves and learn from our mistakes and go from there. Yeah. Well, thank you. And 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 that was very um, very well said. I think you give everyone a lot of food for thought there to think about. Um, yeah, what we can do to, um, you know, kind of help change the culture either in our workplace or, or even more broadly. We're all human. We all make mistakes. I make them all day long. I'm aware of it. I don't beat myself up over it. Or I'm, I'm trying to say, you know what, if I can, I can admit it, I can learn from it, I can move on instead of stewing about it. Like personally, I found it helpful to post a message on social media about a mistake I made. I get it. I you know, share it and I move on. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and I, you know, it's it just, it's amazing that if I didn't make mistakes, I wouldn't be where I am, you know, and, and I still remember yeah. some of the bigger mistakes. And it just, you look back, um, I had a wonderful mentor who has since passed, but he once said to me, what's it going to matter a hundred years from now? And uh, that <laughs> always, as a young person, that really helped keep everything in perspective for me. Yeah. Well, Lori, thank you for sharing your story and, um, perspectives and uh, everything with the audience here today. So um, our guest has been Lori Baker Shenna. Um, her website, you can find more about her at www.loribakershenna.com. And then uh, is there a separate website? For, I didn't ask you anything more about the Lead Hership Consortium. So that's is there a separate. Um, yeah. So it's, um, there's no dot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that. So th there's, it's www.leadhershipconsortium.com. You got to get the H E R in there or else you'll get to someone yeah. else's interesting website. And that is uh, the, uh, <laughs> the training we give specifically to women. Uh, just because it's interesting, there is, I think, big differences on how women are, are uh, navigate the workplace. So, All right. Very good. Well, Lori, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure um, talking to you, getting to know you a little bit here through the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Mark. Take good care.